Oh, what's that? You don't like classical music? All right, what do you like? Oh, you like rock? All right, well, who are some of your faves? Oh, <laughs> you love the strokes. Hey, my name is Maddie Gregg, and in my last video, we uh, defined what a voice is as it pertains to a musical arrangement, as well as defined, broadly speaking, what voice leading is, as well as explored one particular example of how it's essential to the strokes' as sound. Well, this week, we're going to open up the metaphorical box that is voice leading and take a look at the contents inside and see what tools do we actually have regarding voice leading, and how is voice leading facilitated in a piece of music. Let's talk about it. We're still looking at the modern age by the strokes, and this time we're gonna also take a look at the chorus. Jumping right on in, we are in the key of D, and as we established last time in the verse, what we have here is a D major, D add two, and then a G add six to G major. And as we explored and established last time, these major seconds are pretty essential to the sound of this riff. Now jumping on ahead to the chorus, Nick lays out the bedrock pretty well. We have a D1, E minor, 2, F sharp minor, 3, A5. Then Albert assisting with some high single notes up here, F sharp, G, F sharp, E, Mi, Fa, Mi, Re. Nikolai down here in the bottom doing some interesting stuff, we have F sharp, E, F sharp, A. Put it together and that gives us a one in first inversion, two, three, five. The bass giving us this first inversion one chord is of particular interest, but we'll get to that more in depth later. Hey, also, for the sake of this demonstration and analysis, I am leaving the voice out for clarity of education and explanation. So now that we have the harmonic outline of what's going on in this song, it is time to talk about how the Strokes went about arranging this specific set of instruments to be led through the song. The tools at our disposal. So when it comes to voice leading, there's basically two categories. There is contrapuntal motion coming from counterpoint, which is how these voices move in relation to each other. And here you have things like oblique motion, parallel, similar, and contrary. And then you have the motion of the voices in relation to the overall harmony of the song. And here is where you're going to find things like suspension and inversion. And we'll be focusing on those two in particular today. Now, composers who lived and worked during the common practice period of Europe, Mozart, Bach, Handel, Beethoven, name your fave, they studied these concepts, among others, and became masters at applying them within the framework of what was considered the correct way to compose in those time periods. Now, what was correct changed from period to period, and that's why they have distinctions. But luckily, we live in a time period where we don't have to act within those frameworks. In fact, we can just use them as tools to achieve the desired effect wherever we want to use them. And Julian Casablancas did just that. He abstracted and generalized these ideas, applied them to a rock band instrumentation, and created something unique and amazing out of it. That even now, 20 years later, still is difficult to fully understand and emulate. So now, let us attempt to dissect the modern age and see how Julian Casablancas may have applied some of these concepts. So now, getting into the nitty-gritty of it, we're going to start here with similar motion. Similar motion is when two voices move in the same direction. So, this means they can be ascending together or descending together, but they're moving in the same direction at the same time. For example, in the chorus here, when Albert moves from the first part, F-sharp up to G, Nick also moves up from the D up to the E minor. They move up together. And then right after, Albert moves from the G down to the F sharp, and Nick is moving from the E minor down to an F sharp minor. They move down together. And up next is parallel motion. Now, parallel motion is similar to similar motion. Ha. Huh. 
The difference being that the interval, the space between the voices, stays exactly the same no matter how they move. For example, in the verse, when Albert is playing this D major chord, Nikolai is playing the same D, just an octave below, and then when Albert now moves down to the G, Nikolai follows with the same thing. His bass note, the G, is an octave below the lowest note on the guitar. motion produces a blocky, heavy sound and tends to cause different voices to sound as if they're kind of glued together, producing one singular larger voice. And it is because of this effect that composers in the classical common practice period tended to avoid parallel motion because they wanted all of their voices to act distinctly from each other and sound like they were maintaining melodic and rhythmic harmonic independence from each other. But you can use parallel motion however much you want, wherever you want, if that's the effect you're going for. In fact, I guarantee you already use it all the time. Because guess what? A power chord is actually stacked parallel voices. It is a parallel fifth with a parallel octave as well. We'll just move this around. You know, any time you hear a power chord, that's parallel motion. Anyway, as a general precedent habit to get into is you can use parallel motion when you want to create a heavy sound moving around and similar motion when you do want different voices to sound distinct from each other but have them create a significant amount of upward or downward energy together. So if similar movement is when things move in the same direction, Contrary motion is self-explanatory. It is when voices move in the opposite direction as each other. When one moves up, the other moves down, and vice versa. For example, back in the chorus, remember when Nick went from that D up to the E minor? Well, at that same time, while he's making that change, Nikolai is moving from an F sharp down to an E. Nick moves up while Nikolai moves down. And then right after, Nick moves from this E minor down to an F sharp. And while he makes that change, Nikolai moves from the E up to the F sharp. Contrary motion. See, contrary motion is really fascinating because it's an excellent way to create some sort of tension in your arrangement via motion and voice leading rather than via harmony. Though, of course, those two things can be happening simultaneously. But try to visually think about how these voices are moving and how that can create that effect. When they're moving contrarily away from each other like this, it's expanding. It's like almost like a stretching, pulling feeling like taffy being pulled. And there's an inherent amount of tension buildup in that, right? Similarly, on the opposite direction, if you they're moving closer together, it's almost like they're being compressed, like you're pushing it together, ready to bounce back no matter which way you're doing it. And our last type of contrapuntal motion is oblique motion. Oblique motion is when one voice is staying the same and another voice is moving around it. Doesn't matter how, doesn't matter if it's under it, below it, up, down, even if it crosses, that is oblique motion. For example, back in the verse, while Albert is holding out this D major chord the whole time, that is when Nikolai is moving his voice around. He's going down and back up while Albert is staying in the same place the whole time. And then they switch roles. When Nick is down here on the E, he stays there while Albert is moving from the D down to the G. Oblique motion is really interesting because I personally think it sounds the most choir-esque. It is very common in an SATB arrangement to see one or more voices stay the same while 
one or more of the others move because that alone can change what the chord is at that time. It also doesn't feel like as much of a massive move as contrary or parallel similar motion. So you see it often where an upper line will make smaller steps while the other ones stay the same to create interest melodically and harmonically while not making big moves necessarily. It's like drawing a painting. You want to have big strokes and some littler ones as well. Then again, I may also be thinking it sounds the most choir-esque because it's basically what happens when you have Gregorian chant-esque drones. We will soon see good booty and composing with drones in general is just full of oblique motion. Something else really interesting about oblique motion is it can allow you to create suspension. And yes, suspension as it pertains to voice leading is different than just a suspended chord. In order to have a proper suspension in voice leading, it needs to be prepared by voice leading. What that means in this context is you have a note that is suspended across a chord change facilitated via oblique motion, and that note is being held suspended across the chord change, becoming a non-chord tone, a note not in the chord that everything else is moving to, before falling into place in the new chord. TLDR, a note is suspended across a chord change via oblique motion, becoming a non-chord tone and then falling into place. And we do see that here in the verse. In Nick's guitar, again, he's doing this F sharp, then this E, and remember, when Albert and Nikolai move from the D major down to the G major, that stays, that is suspended. We have a D major, and then Nick's riff going down to the E makes us a D at two, and then the E in octaves is held while the other instruments move down to a G. But the notes in G are G, B, D. Nick stays on an E, a non-chord tone, before eventually falling down to this D here. That is a properly prepared suspension. But the Strokes don't do it with a choir or with an orchestra, they do it with a rock band. How cool is that? Wait, but Matty Greg, how is that different from a suspended chord again? Good question. Again, to clarify, a suspension as a voice leading tool is different from suspension as a harmonic tool, though they can occur simultaneously. In order for a voice leading suspension to be prepared properly, again, the voice needs to stay across the chord change and then fall. But you can just throw a suspended chord in wherever you want. Let's say you have F sharp minor, and then you move to A sus4 down to A. Well, the note facilitating that suspension, this D here, that was not present in the F sharp. So this is a suspended chord, but not a suspension in terms of voice leading. And the final tool we are going to talk about today is inversion. Inversion is when you have a different note other than the root note of a chord in the bottom most voice. So D major is D, F sharp, A, and that's in root position. But then if you move the D up and now you have F sharp, A, D, it's still a D major, but now it's in first inversion because the third is in the bottom. Then you move up again and you have A, D, F sharp, still a D major because it's the same three notes, but now you're in second position because the fifth is in the bottom. And that could be done like this with one hand or it can be done like this with your bass. Like I mentioned before, a major reason why common practice composers started developing and using voice leading, as I've been describing, is to maintain an independence between all the lines, which is facilitated well, like in an orchestra or a choir, something like that. And when you free yourself up to think about all your different voices or instruments as individual actors, then you can put them in different places. So you can think to yourself, yeah, okay, we are going to a, a D major chord, but that doesn't mean my bass has to go to a D. It could go to an F sharp instead. 
Not only can inversion make your voice leading easier depending on what instruments you are arranging for. For example, if you're going from a one chord to a five chord, it would be a lot easier for your bass rather than jumping all the way from here down to here to just go from here to up to here. It's a much closer distance for that singer. So you get second inversion five chord, which provides a different feeling than the root position does. And we can use that to our advantage. And choosing inversions is incredibly subjective. I mean, how to apply most of the stuff we're talking about here is subjective. It's just up to you to use these tools to get the desired effect you want in your music. So when deciding on inversions, you can ask yourself, you can get your hands in there and experiment and see and see the difference in emotional flavor and nuance that these different inversions can give you. Like a D major in root position just sounds very complete, very strong. Whereas a D major in second inversion, so we have the fifth in the bottom, it feels, it has a little more energy. It's less complete, but it is still very strong and heroic, very sure of itself. And then if you go to first inversion with the third in the bass, it has a, just a touch of bittersweetness to it. Again, the root position is very complete. And now the first inversion almost has an unsureness to it. Like, yes, I am a hero and I will do this, but I'm reflecting back on memories of all I've learned along the way and thinking about who I've lost and what has changed. Now that was a really cheesy metaphor, but I encourage you to experiment here and just get in here and see how the different inversions can make the same chord feel different. Now talking about how it's applied to the modern age, I think it is an amazing choice to start the chorus with your one chord in first inversion. It adds this emotional nuance to it. So coming from this G major, go, 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 we could go to a root position, leaving just in time, and that's pretty good. But every time in the verse, when we're moving back and forth from the G to the D, we always go from the G to the D back in root position. So that would just be kind of redundant and repetitive. The choice to go from here, go, 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 leaving just in time, to a new inversion of the same chord presents to you very strongly. We are in a new section. Things are different now. But how are they different? I mean, this is the part of the song where lyrically it's kind of coming together. We're in the modern age. You know, this is the world we live in. Things ain't like they used to be. And I think of the choices you could have made for a, a one chord inversion, that is definitely the best one to choose. Go, 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 leaving just in time. Go, 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 leaving just in time. Go, 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 leaving just in time. In this case, it provides variation on what you've already been doing, but also provides emotional nuance. Good stuff. So looking at all your voices and using these tools, you can create an arrangement that feels very organic and varied and alive in a way that a lot of pieces don't necessarily feel. And great composers would consider a great composition to be one that uses the tools in a varied manner, having different voices act in different ways across the piece, uh, providing intrigue, interest, nuance, and variation to keep your interest through the whole piece. And this song absolutely does that. So let's put it all together and present this information visually and try to take a look at how all the different voices interact with each other and the harmony using all of the tools that we talked about today to create a fantastic piece of rock music that even Mozart would look at and approve of.
So there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. I definitely hope you learned something. Let me know down in the comments if you have any feedback about the way I presented information, what you are intrigued about, any questions you have, anything you'd like to know more about. If you'd like me to continue exploring the Strokes' music or maybe do something else, I'm open to all of these suggestions. If you notice, the turnaround on this video was a lot quicker than I have historically been able to do, and that is because I just quit my job to try to pursue this stuff full time, and it would mean the world to me if you would want to support in whatever way you can. You can like and subscribe to the channel, share the video. If you want to support me in a monetary sense, you can subscribe to my Patreon or take private lessons from me. Link for both of those things will be in the description below. Low. And of course, I have to give out a very special thank you to my current patrons, Drake Gomer, Gray Emerson, and Andre Moffat. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I really hope that you learned something today that you can take with you and apply to your own music and your own songwriting.